Welcome to Israel. In the Bible, this territory is called the Promised Land. It's a war-torn land that has been center stage for many battles throughout history. You may recall some of the more incredible battles that took place here long ago, when Jericho's enormous walls came tumbling down, or the famous story of David versus the Philistine giant, Goliath. Or you may be more familiar with Israel's more recent wars and ongoing conflict. But did you know that according to the Bible, God is eternally intertwined with each and every one of Israel's battles, whether Israel wins or loses. And although God does not intervene every time, in fact, Israel has had her fair share of tragic losses. It seems that at pivotal times in this nation's history, God has supernaturally backed Israel and ensured her victory and continued survival. But how true are these stories? Is there any archeological or historical evidence to back them? And perhaps the bigger question is why? Why would a loving and just God favor one nation over another, ensure their continued survival and promise them and only them this land? These are the questions I hope to answer as we explore some of Israel's most astounding miraculous victories. This is the Promised Land, and behind me, the Temple Mount, the most sacred hill within the Promised Land. According to the Bible, it was toward this land that Moses led Israel after escaping slavery in Egypt. And when Israel reached its borders, God commanded them to completely dispossess the nations that lived here, promising to divinely assist Israel with this task. But why? Why would a loving God command such a thing? Why was this land so important to Israel and to God that he would promise Israel's victory over it? To answer these questions, we need to open the Bible and travel back in time about 600 years before Moses and meet a man called Abraham. It's in the first few pages of the Bible that we find Abraham's story in Genesis 12 and verse one. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And once Abraham leaves his homeland and arrives in the land God shows him, God reiterates this promise many times in the chapters which follow. In Genesis 17, seven, we read, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. It's incredible to think that roughly 4,000 years ago, God made this everlasting promise to Abraham and his descendants, the Jewish people today. According to the Bible, this land belongs to them by divine decree. So does the God of the Bible show favoritism? Perhaps. But the Bible is very clear. God created the nation of Israel with the intention of enriching and blessing the entire world. For God so loved the world. And this land is where it was all supposed to happen. The 
The Promised Land has a long and meaningful history. Upon its rugged terrain sits the ancient holy city of Jerusalem and the oldest and lowest city on earth, Jericho. From the Red Sea at its southernmost border, the Promised Land stretches along the Mediterranean Sea and northward to the Golan Heights. By the shores of the Galilee, where Jesus spent most of his life, peace is almost tangible. But the land of Israel is no stranger to conflict. It bears the lasting scars of both ancient and modern battles. Throughout history, many civilizations have laid claim to this territory, but only one of these nations has called it home for nearly 4,000 years. And it is only this nation that can claim some of the most miraculous victories this land has ever seen. In order to understand how the Jewish nation, Israel, came to be here and why God might have sometimes come to her aid in battle, we need to revisit the very first few chapters of the Bible where their miraculous story begins. I think if you want to understand the Jewish people, you have to understand God's goal in creation. Why did he create the world in the first place? God is only good and he wanted to bestow that good upon something, someone. And uh, for that, he created the world. God creates a world and creates human beings to have a relationship with them. That's the story of God and Adam and Eve in the garden, but that goes wrong pretty early and they get banished from the garden. And the next 10 generations or so, in terms of the genealogy of the Bible, is the story of that relationship kind of falling apart, where the world degenerates into idolatry. There's a, the whole purpose of creation is lost. That relationship with God is lost. And there's also a moral decline. So in the middle, there's that salvage attempt called the Noah's Ark flood story, where God chooses another individual to try and get the world back on target. But we see that Noah is, is righteous enough to save himself, but not proactive enough to save the world. So the world continues to decline until the Tower of Babel story. And the, the plot of the Tower of Babel is that humanity unites, but for all the wrong reasons. And just when it looks like game over, along comes one man, Abraham. And God chooses Abraham. There's only one sentence in the Bible in Genesis where God says, I know that he will, you know, he will be loyal to me and he will command his children after me to do, to do my work, to, do, to live with the reality of me and to teach, about, to teach about me to the world, basically, to reconnect humanity to one God. I think Abraham first was a friend of God. Um, we know that God had interacted with Abraham on many occasions. I, I'm often reminded of um, when the Lord came with two angels to visit Abraham. It says that he, he stood at his tent and he ran to meet the Lord. And for me, it always reminds me that you only stand and run to someone you recognize, a friend. It's not a stranger to him. And that's why I think Abraham was primarily a friend of God. And based on that friendship, the depth of that friendship, um, the Lord often uh, even recounts to Abraham what he's going to do in the future. Again, that's a friendship dynamic. What, what am I, God, going to do in the future? And, and we hear God's heart to say, uh, I don't want to withhold from Abraham what I'm about to do. All of that to me means there's been an investment in the friendship, in the relationship between God and Abraham. And it's through that investment um, that a covenant is made, an agreement that says, I will forever be your God and you will forever be my friend. And here's what I promise you into the future. According to the Bible, God promised to bless Abraham and his descendants. He swore that they would be God's chosen vehicle to bring blessing to the entire world. Then, through an ancient sacrificial ceremony, God sealed his everlasting covenant with Abraham a covenant perpetually signified by the circumcision of all males in Abraham's household. The covenant line would descend from Abraham and Sarah to their son Isaac and down to Isaac's son Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. During the ceremony, God promised the entire land of Canaan to Abraham's descendants as their eternal possession. God then foretold Abraham that although the children of Israel would experience slavery in Egypt for 400 years, God would rescue them 
and they would at long last inherit the land of Canaan as their everlasting possession. There, Israel would fully realize her destiny as a nation called to bless the world. I think God is showing us that he's creating a new nation. As part of that nation, some of the characteristics of a nationhood are things like you have your own language, you have your own uh, weekly and monthly and yearly calendars, you have your own celebrations, you have your own food and dress, but you also have your own land. And I think what God is doing there is he's establishing a new people and a new nation for a specific purpose of what we would call the Abrahamic covenant and the Abrahamic blessing. What was their job? What was their chosenness? But to bring the reality of God's truth to the world. They were really a nation of priesthood, a nation of evangelists, bringing the light of Messiah and his salvation to the whole world. And to do that, we needed a, a covenant land. We, we needed a, a headquarters, if you will, for the presence of God to show up on earth. Every, everybody is equal meaning that no, there's no different statuses or anything. Um, everyone was made in God's image. The Jewish people were chosen to, just to be the servant. We see in the Bible that God says when they come out of Exodus, when he formed the nation, when the, at the birth of the nation, he calls Israel his son, his firstborn son also referred to as his servant. Right through Isaiah, we see that he speaks of Israel as his servant. So, so there to serve and to ultimately bring the focus of the nations to God. God doesn't just tell Abraham, just go somewhere. Just, when, just like when the Jews leave Egypt, many, many generations later in the Exodus narrative, he doesn't say, okay, now you're no longer slaves, you're free. You know, here's a plane ticket, go to Europe. We're specifically told over and over again the land of Israel. The land of Israel is not just a, a destination, it's a destiny. You know, I'm also a tour guide and the way I explain it is, and I learned this the hard way on my speaking tours around the world, is every country in the world has like a different wall outlet and a different voltage. And if you don't have the right adapter and the right plug and the right voltage, your appliance doesn't really work well. So the land of Israel is that unique piece of real estate where the Jewish people can plug into and actualize their potential. In Psalms 24, we see that it says the earth is the Lord and everything in it. It belongs to him, so he can decide what he wants to do with it. Even in Job, um, he says to Job and his friends, where were you when I created the world? Uh, what do you know about what I want to do with this world? So we see in that that um, God designated a certain area where he wants this kingdom to be built and from where it needs to be spread to, to all over the world. God promises Abram that his descendants will multiply, will be like the sand on the shore, like the stars in the sky, and will inherit all of this uh, biblical land, the promised land. But it doesn't tell him the time, the framework of when that will happen. And the Israelites actually will multiply when enslaved by the Egyptians, according to the biblical narrative, and only by the figure of Moses Okay, uh, f uh, assisted with the uh, priest Aaron, will they lead through a successful rebellion and leave Egypt and return to that promised land? You've probably heard the famous story of Moses leading the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, across the Red Sea to freedom and the promised land. And although Hollywood depicts that event with a happy ending, things didn't all go as planned. When Moses sent spies into the land God promised Israel, reports came back of giants in the land and of enormous fortified cities. Israel was discouraged to say the least. They complained to Moses and wanted to run back to slavery in Egypt rather than face the giants ahead of them. As a result, God was upset with Israel and didn't let that generation enter the promised land. Not even Moses was allowed to enter. They all died in the wilderness only their children would inherit the land under the leadership of Joshua, who was an assistant to Moses. At the end of Moses' life, he gathered Israel around him and presented Joshua as Israel's leader in his place. In Deuteronomy, we read, Then Moses went out and spoke these words to all Israel. I am now 120 years old, and I am no longer able to lead you. The Lord has said to me, You shall not cross the Jordan. The Lord your God himself will cross over ahead of you. 
He will destroy these nations before you and you will take possession of their land. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them for the Lord your God goes with you and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, be strong and courageous for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them. And you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Behind me, the ancient ruins of Jericho. This was the very first city Israel would conquer within the promised land under the courageous leadership of Joshua. Back in the day, Jericho's walls were massive, standing roughly 46 feet high. How would an inferior nomadic group of people be able to conquer such a city? Be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. These words are frequently repeated in the pages of the Bible leading up to and during the conquest of the promised land. It would certainly take an enormous amount of courage and faith to conquer a land that already contained strong, fortified cities and very capable armies. It's interesting when the spies go into the land of Israel, that story that gets the Jewish people in so much trouble that causes the wandering, they come back, you know, these 12 spies, one from each tribe, and they're carrying the produce of the land of Israel, this like giant cluster of grapes. And, you know, basically the message they give is, you know, you see the size of this fruit, which is pretty awesome. You should see the size of the people eating the fruit. And we're like, we were like ants in their eyes. Now, Joshua is an interesting figure because he had been with the Israelites all the way back in Egypt. So he, he experienced some of that persecution coming out. Later, he was uh, seen as Moses' aide. And of course, later in Joshua's life, we know he's one of the 12 spies. He's one of the two faithful spies that come back with a good report with Caleb. And they say, yes, let's take up God on his promise. We can take the land of Israel uh, by God's power. The land of Israel, which was then called Canaan, was comprised of seven what we call Canaanite nations. It's actually a generic term used to describe the different peoples that lived here who were Canaanites and Jebusites and Hittites, and they lived in 31 city-states. A more contemporary example would be like Germany or Italy hundreds of years ago with Venice and Florence and Rome. These people were idolatrous people who were viewed as being evil in their behavior and were in the land of Israel, the only people, by the way, who could claim to be more indigenous to the land than the Jewish people or Israelis of today would be those nations that don't exist anymore. And they're sort of custod as custodians keeping the land until the Jewish people arrive. Now, frankly, the shortest way is uh, directly through the Sinai Peninsula, but the Book of Numbers tells us of the king of Arad facing them, blocking the way. So they had to do a great detour, go all the way back to the Red Sea, cross the land of the Edomites and the Moabites, and eventually reach the Promised Land from the east, facing Jericho and having to cross the Jordan River to do so. But Moses will not be part of that. He will die shortly before the crossing, be buried somewhere on a hilltop facing the Promised Land. And Joshua will be his successor, the military command, the general. He will uh, lead the crossing. He will make sure everyone is kosher, <laughs> verify the circumcision of all the men, and then they are ready to battle over the first site, Jericho. The Bible tells us that at the command of Joshua, the priests carried the Ark of the Covenant, a shrine which represented God's presence, and led Israel to the Jordan River. Then, as the priests set foot into the river, its waters stopped flowing, and Israel crossed on dry ground, just as they had crossed the Red Sea under the leadership of Moses. Through this miracle, God built Israel's confidence in Joshua as their new leader in Moses' place. Shortly after this, while Israel was encamped near Jericho, an angel visited Joshua to encourage him yet again. The angel introduced himself as the commander of the army of the Lord. He told Joshua to take off his sandals because Joshua was on holy ground. 
God then promised Joshua that victory over Jericho belonged to Israel if they would follow God's instructions carefully. God said, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. And when you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. So Jericho posed a very intimidating uh, city to be conquered. It wasn't going to be easy. I don't know that the Israelites had an adequately trained army. We do know that in the desert they were trained. Some of them came from a military background. They had to fight a few battles before Jericho. But this is one of those instances where God puts them up against an adversary that they won't win. They won't be victorious unless they trust in God. Well, we don't have uh, other accounts, only what the Bible tells us. Uh, it tells us that the men were Sheshmot Ribo, which is 600,000 people, which means about 2 million people in general. That's a huge amount of people crossing for 40 years the desert. And academia has a big problem with that number and that account. We don't really have evidence of this, but people that just move from one spot to another will not leave a lot of trace in, in the first place, okay? I served in the army. Sometimes we would camp in a specific site. And when we would move out, we will clear out everything. So you wouldn't be able to tell that we actually stayed there for a while. But we're, you're dealing on one hand with a large nation of people who have marched into the land, but the other hand, we're also not dealing with a professional army. These are wanderers in a desert who are fighting against city-states with armies. Now, Joshua had seen his mentor Moses go through something like this coming out of Egypt. Remember, Moses was trapped, and all of the people of Israel were trapped between the Red Sea, a mountain on the right, a mountain on the left, and the Egyptian army behind them, and they were trapped. And only through trusting in God, Moses stepping out with his staff, God doing a miracle, the opening of the Red Sea, and then finally the closing of the Red Sea, were they safe from their adversaries. And Joshua finds himself in a very similar position at Jericho, walls that they can't conquer, an army they may not be trained uh, to defeat, but God gave them the instruction. And as silly or as uh, outside the box as the instruction might have seemed to them, hey, blow a shofar, blow a trumpet, march around the wall, what is that gonna do? It's not gonna do anything in the physical realm. In the spirit realm, however, we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness. And I think that's what Joshua was actually doing. He was defeating, through obedience and faith, he was defeating principalities of darkness. The Bible tells us that having successfully conquered and completely destroyed Jericho, Joshua cursed the city, saying, Cursed before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. God had commanded Israel to utterly destroy everything in Jericho and to take none of its treasure. Joshua then led the armies of Israel to conquer Ai, the city just west of Jericho. When spies brought back word to Joshua that Ai would be easily defeated, only 3,000 men of Israel were sent to take the city. Yet Israel was defeated by the men of Ai because they had not listened to God's instructions regarding Jericho. An Israelite named Achan had taken some of Jericho's goods and hid them. And so having punished Achan for his sin, Joshua led Israel to successfully conquer the city of Ai. City by city, battle by battle, the nation of Israel took the land of Canaan as their divine inheritance, causing the fear of the one true God to spread through the promised land. We have a, a, a number of different reactions. If you look at the book of Joshua, much of which describes the conquest and settling of the land, there's a few stories about like the Girgashites, for instance, which is not specifically said in the, the book of Joshua, but it's a tradition that they just flee. They just pack up and leave. Then, then we have in um, Givon, the Gibeonites, 
fool the Jewish people. They wear out their shoes. They make it look like they've been traveling for like weeks and weeks. They actually came from a few miles away and they come to Joshua and they said, we heard about the miracles of leaving Egypt and, and we want to join you guys. And Joshua says, cool, you know, we always invite, come join. And then he finds out they were lied to, but a deal's a deal. So they're allowed to stay amongst the Jewish people, although they're used as servants. And when they're later attacked by the other Canaanites, for like joining the Jewish people, then Joshua goes to the defense. Having conquered Jericho and Ai, and having made peace with Gibeon, a powerful Canaanite city, Israel had become a noticeable threat in Canaan. As a result, the king of Jerusalem joined forces with four other kings to attack the Gibeonites. Because of Israel's alliance with Gibeon, Joshua led his armies to their aid. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took the Canaanite armies by surprise and defeated them, but not without divine intervention. During this battle, huge hailstones rained down upon Israel's enemies. More men were killed by hailstones than were killed in combat. On this same day, the Bible tells us that Joshua commanded the sun and moon to stand still until Israel was able to utterly defeat her enemies. Having won the battle and pursued and killed all five enemy kings, Joshua said to Israel, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you are going to fight. God intervenes a few times in a few miraculous ways to like suspend the laws of nature and destroy the Jewish people's enemies without the fight. But most of the time it's, it's battle. But what is very clear and it's said over and over again is on a psychological level, God says, I've handed the land to you. Meaning the people are so scared. And if you know about the history of warfare, what's in the, the soldiers' minds and their attitude towards the battle makes a big difference. There were over 30 cities that they conquered in a row and someone that might come about it from a, from a battle background, a military background, maybe a sports background. Anytime you find out that you are 30, 31, 32, 33 victories in a row without a defeat, I think the morale of the people had to be high. Now physically they were probably tired and they had, they had seen many miracles along the way, but my sense of their faith, it had to be high. When you, when you win 30 plus victories in a row over different foes, different adversaries, different type of weapons that they're trying to use against you, different walls of the city, different strategies, different military tactics, you find out quickly that the Lord will conquer any strategy the enemy puts in front of you. Having conquered Jericho and Ai and defeated the five Canaanite kings, Joshua moved south and conquered Lachish, Hebron, Debir, and Gaza. Then Joshua led Israel northward toward Hazor, the city the Bible calls the head of all cities in Canaan. Around me are the ruins of ancient Hazor in northern Israel. According to the Bible, Jabin, the king of Hazor, heard of Israel's military conquests in the south and summoned several surrounding kings to gather near the waters of Merom, a lake formed by the River Jordan 10 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. The Bible says that all of the armies united against Israel were as the sand that is on the seashore in multitude with horses and chariots. But again, God encouraged Joshua and told him not to be afraid. And the ensuing battle became one more miraculous victory for Israel. After this battle, the Bible tells us that Joshua conquered Hetzor, killed its king and burned the city to the ground. But how true is this story? Is there any archeological evidence that the Israelites did in fact conquer such a powerful king and defeat a sea of armies gathered against them. The book of Joshua recounts how a group of desert nomads managed to conquer more than 30 powerful city-states in the Promised Land. According to the Bible, some of these battles were won entirely by God's miraculous intervention. And when the powerful kings of Canaan joined forces to attack the children of Israel, incredibly, 
Israel was able to utterly defeat them. But can archaeology confirm any of these events? Can we even confirm that Israel existed at all during this time period? So we know that around 1200 BC, which is the period we are talking about, there was an Egyptian king by the name of Merneptah who led his army into this country and he conquered several sites, which we know very well, and he ends by saying, Israel is annihilated. Israel has no seed. I destroyed Israel completely. So the Egyptian king, Merneptah, knows that in this part of the world, there are people who are called Israelites. By whom? By the Egyptians, by others, maybe how many? A thousand, five thousand, I don't know. But there were people here close to the period which we are talking about, conquest, Hatzor, Jericho. There were people here known as Israelites. The Egyptian pharaoh, Merneptah, who lived more than 3,200 years ago, boasts that he was able to defeat Israel, among others living in the land of Canaan at the time. His mention of Israel is the oldest record of the nation known today. Clearly, at the time of Merneptah, Israel was a force to be reckoned with, a nation that the pharaoh was proud to claim he destroyed. But what else can archaeology tell us about Israel? Is there any evidence that God helped them conquer this land? Well, we are now in the oasis of Jericho, and behind me is the actual biblical tale, the mound, the, the place where you have the ruins of human use here from Neolithic times and up to Roman times. And the most important layers are the ones of the Canaanites, followed by the Israelites. According to the Bible, that was caused by Joshua and his men conquering the site and demolishing the Canaanite city. What does it say in the biblical text after Jericho fell, according to the biblical tradition? It says, may a curse come on the men who will rebuild the city. Nobody is allowed to rebuild the city and only in the ninth century, somebody came from Beit El and he rebuilt Archaeology shows it, something was built there, and he paid, his son died, and so on and so forth. After the city is destroyed, there must be a hiatus, there is a kind of a curse. So Jericho is one of the first sites to be investigated by this modern scholarship or, or academic field called archaeology, the study of the material culture of ancient people. Because the book of Joshua in chapter 6 gives us such a detailed account of how the city was mighty and fortified and yet demolished by Joshua and his people. You know that archaeologists love destructions. Because, you know, the misfortune of the ancients is our fortune. Jericho, what do we know about Jericho? A destruction. Yes or no, it's a different way. Masada, okay? What do we know about Masada? A destruction. Pompeii, Herculan, whenever there is destruction, we are happy because there are a lot of finds and we get good chronology. Dead Sea Scrolls, if there wouldn't be a destruction, we wouldn't have the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? So we owe a lot to the misfortune of the ancients. The misfortune of Jericho was first excavated in the early 1930s using modern methods by the late archaeologist John Garstang. In his final summary of his findings, he wrote, in a word, in all the material details and in date, the fall of Jericho took place as described in the biblical narrative. Our demonstration is limited, however, to material observations. The walls fell, shaken apparently by earthquake, and the city was destroyed by fire about 1400 BC. These are the basic facts resulting from our investigations. But between 1952 and 1958, British archaeologist Kathleen Kenyon conducted an excavation at Jericho using stratigraphic techniques, relying heavily on broken pottery to date the city's destruction. Because she did not find pottery shards imported from Cyprus, something highly indicative of the Late Bronze Age, she concluded that the city was likely destroyed in the Middle Bronze Age, a couple hundred years prior to the Israelite conquest. And this is the opinion held by most archaeologists to this day. Figures like Warren and Wilson, uh, British uh, engineers and officers, were also pioneers in the field of archaeology. 
they've done mostly surveys and they've noted that there are ruins here, including walls. But a later development of the field, especially the analysis of pottery shards as indicator of the periods, have demonstrated uh, that the Canaanites that lived here date to the Middle Bronze Age mostly. When the Israelites came here and replaced the Late Bronze Age Canaanites. So there is a gap between what archaeology tells us and what the Bible tells us. It's now pretty much an understanding by most archaeologists on this issue. Yet you could argue that the dating is wrong. We just don't have the chronology fixed according to what the pottery shards are telling us. Maybe the Canaanites did live here to a later time but did not leave enough did not leave enough traces behind them. Keep in mind that the site that you're seeing is not completely excavated. It's excavated in bits and pieces and maybe the, what's called the missing link in anthropology, okay? The missing link to the uh, validation of the biblical narrative is still laying there. Because so much of Jericho has not been excavated, it still holds many secrets. While there is undeniable evidence of destruction at Jericho that matches the biblical account, convincing evidence that its destruction occurred at the time of Israel's conquest remains in question, buried for future archaeologists to uncover. The fact that we don't find evidence doesn't disprove the story. Okay, or a quote that I like using often, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. How much of us will be available in 3,000 years? How much of this wall will be visible in 3,000 years? Okay, the wars of, of the Second World War, okay, uh, the invasion into Normandy. How much of it can be seen today, 70 years later? So you have to remember these things in mind when you're trying to validate an account from 3,000 years ago. Although not every city mentioned in the biblical conquest can be verified archaeologically, there is one thing that most archaeologists agree upon. At the end of the Late Bronze Age, between 1550 and 1200 BCE, Canaanite culture came to an end, and a number of major cities in Canaan were destroyed by semi-nomadic Israelites who constructed humble settlements on the ruins. It so happens that the city that best exemplifies this is the city referred to in the Bible as the head of all the cities in Canaan, the city of Hetzor. Hetzor is about um, 15 times the size of Jerusalem of the Iron Age, of the Israelite period. It is 200 acres in size. It is 800 dunams, if we count in local, 800 dunams, whereas Israelite uh, Jerusalem is about 60 dunams. So we are talking about an enormous, enormous, the biggest tell, the biggest city in the country, number one. Actually, we are part of Syria. The southern extension of Syria, where I'm talking about not, polit not modern times, but ancient times. Because in order to understand Hatzor, you must know that it is, from the point of view, architecture, pottery, defenses, art, architecture, uh, religion, languages. We are the southernmost part of the north, all the way to Babylon. This is what we are. Further south is a different story. Megiddo is already a different story. We are the southern edge of the north. That's number one. Number two, not only was it enormous, the Bible calls it the head of all those kingdoms. It was definitely the head of all those kingdoms, which we can prove archeologically. Although the city of Jericho was a strategic city for the Israelites to conquer in order to gain access to the promised land, the city of Hetzor was critical in their victory over all of Canaan. At the time of the conquest, it was an enormous, highly fortified and militarily sophisticated city. Its king was the most powerful king in the Promised Land, and his headquarters the largest stronghold in the land. Whether or not Joshua and his armies could conquer Hetzor and its king was therefore pivotal in Israel's victory over the Promised Land. Yavin, the king of Hetzor, is called in the Bible, 
ידין מלך כנען אשר ישב בחצור. Okay, it is Yadin, the king of Canaan, who dwelt at Hatzor. He was the king of Canaan, but his uh, home, his palace, or whatever he was, okay, he was uh, president of the United States, who lived in Washington. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so even the Bible refers to him as number one. But after Hatzor was destroyed, the land was open for the Israelites to settle all the way from Mount Heron in the north, all the way down to the Arava on the border of Egypt. Hatsor was the most powerful and significant city to be conquered in all of the Promised Land. When its king summoned several armies of Canaan to join forces and destroy Israel once and for all, the challenge for Israel was immense. Israel was far outnumbered, and the armies allied against her were powerful and well-equipped. Not only was her survival in jeopardy, God's promises to her were also hanging in the balance. So can such an unbelievable victory be proven archeologically? Did Joshua and the Israelites really defeat the king of Hetzor and conquer the most powerful city in all of Canaan? We have clear evidence that the place was destroyed. Number two, we are clear evidence that it was destroyed by fire, not by earthquake, not by any nature. How do Joshua, the book of Joshua tells us so, we shall come back to it in a minute. All statues were deliberately destroyed. The head was chopped off, the hands were chopped. This does not happen as a result of an earthquake. Somebody must have done it. So Hatzor was destroyed in a fire which was not a normal fire. You know, the normal fire is about 700 degrees centigrade. Hatzor was destroyed in a fire that was more than 1,200 degrees centigrade. How do we know that? Because pots melted. Pots do not melt in a temperature which is less than 1,200 degrees. Bricks turn to glass. It takes this uh, high temperature. So maybe this is why the one who wrote the biblical narrative said, no other site was destroyed, Hatzor alone was destroyed. Maybe there was a memory, because other sites were destroyed as well. We know this, and archaeology shows it. So Hatzor was destroyed in a terrible fire, as described in the book of Joshua. Archaeology clearly validates the Bible story regarding how Joshua and Israel destroyed Hatzor. But can we really be sure that it was, in fact, the children of Israel who were responsible for Hetzor's demise. We don't have an inscription, I, king, so-and-so destroyed Hetzor. The only inscription we have is the biblical text, right? So if you want to check who did it, you cannot. You could only have to check who could have done it. Who? If you take out of consideration people from outer space, you are left with a very, very small number of candidates who could have done it. The Hittites were already in decline. Babylon was in decline. Who was around? The Arameans were settling at the time. The Sea people are settling at the time. The Arabs are settling, at, not the Muslims, the Arabs are settling at the time. The Israelites are settling at the time according to the biblical narrative. So who could have done it? The Egyptians could still have done it because the decline of Egypt starts a little bit later. But we are told by all Egyptologists and by all the documents that Ramses II was never at Hatzor, he was never in the region. Many, many other places are conquered. Not Hatzor is not mentioned anywhere. So maybe they are out of the question. Number two, the sea people. The sea people can be uh, detected easily by their pottery. Out of the millions and millions of shirts that we found at Hatzor, there's not one shirt that belongs to the Sea People. Not one. In addition, Hatzor is inland. The Sea People are not interested in that part of it. The, they are settling along the coast, always along the coast. So Hatzor is out of their interest. We are left, what can I do? We are left with the only ones who have a tradition that they did it. Most archaeologists agree that it was, in fact, the nomadic nation of Israel that somehow managed to conquer Canaan's most powerful city. 
the broken and desecrated idols unearthed here, further demonstrate that the powers that once ruled this territory were intentionally cut off. According to the Bible, only the one true God was to be worshiped in this land. God had told Abraham, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. Know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. The Bible is clear that God intended for Israel to take this land as their eternal possession. God would allow the Canaanites who resided here to continue in their corruption and idolatry until he could bear it no more. Then, God in his sovereignty and absolute love for all of humankind would command Israel to do the unimaginable, to utterly destroy the Amorites and all of the Canaanites in this land in fulfillment of his promises to Abraham. Even in the wars um, of Israel, you can see that in the Bible, there's a, there's a very strong moral compass. So we have to settle the land. There needs to be a conquest of the land. Um, we also see that the Bible speaks of the iniquities of the, the nations will run full. And in that time, Israel will then come to the place that God chose for them to be. But even in the warfare, there always needs to be negotiations first. Um, the way that the people will be handled afterwards. Even the trees during warfare, there are certain um, parameters on how to deal with it. So, so it's a very um, moral warfare if it had to be taken. According to the Bible, this land had to be taken by Israel so that God's plan of salvation for the world could be realized. The nations here prior to Israel's conquest posed an enormous threat to God's intentions to bless the world through Abraham. There's a series of campaigns in the book of Joshua where the Canaanite, the Canaanite kingdoms ally themselves to fight. They're the ones who are on the offensive. After the initial two cities are conquered, which are the city of Jericho and Ai, and each of those campaigns ended, ends in disaster for the Canaanites with their cities being conquered. But ironically, against the wishes of God, when they stop attacking the Jewish people, the Jewish people stop attacking them and leave pockets of Canaanites in the land of Israel, including the city of Jerusalem, for 440 years until the time of King David, which, by the way, God, through the prophet, says is a massive mistake. He says, I'm God. You can't be more merciful than I am. If I tell you to get rid of these people one way or another, you do it. And if you don't do it, then their influence, their idolatry and their morality is going to seep back into you guys and eventually pollute your morality, pull you away from relationship with me, which is going to end in disaster. Israel did not completely conquer every city in Canaan as God had commanded. This would, in fact, become a big problem for Israel in her future. Yet both the Bible and archaeology are clear. Israel conquered most of this land and began the establishment of what would soon be a powerful kingdom. God was faithful to the promises he had made to Abraham. His descendants had arrived, and they would not have conquered the powerful cities of Canaan without God's help. Israel's victory over the Promised Land was just the beginning of God's plan to repair a broken world and draw humanity back to Himself. The world broke with, with, with Adam, the first Adam. And in Jewish thought, we have tikkun olam, where this vessel that broke in the beginning needs to be put together again. Ultimately, that vessel, um, the final vessel, with the partnership that we brought in, in the process, will be more, will be met with more splendor than, than the original vessel. So to, to, to bring, to repair the world and to be partners with God, and to ultimately get that vessel to contain his goodness. Also, we know that the Bible speaks of a priestly nation um, and a light unto the nations. But this was a process. It didn't happen in a day. Um, we are in the year 5,780. And slowly we are now moving towards the point where we can see things coming together. Um, the Jewish people being the intercessors for the world, um, 
we see that in Sukkot, we see that in the Torah when God says she will offer 70 bulls for 70 nations. Also, we see in Zechariah that ultimately all the nations will come up to Jerusalem and the Jewish people will be that priestly nation serving at that point. Did Abraham and his descendants need a, a land, a physical land to be part of this covenant? I think they did because it's a land of example. Uh, in the Bible, we even find in the Torah laws that there are laws uh, in uh, accordance with the land itself. How do we treat visitors? How do we treat the poor? How do we treat worshipers and sojourners? And all of that really cannot be applied unless there's a physical land. So for me, it's eternal, it's physical, but I think it needed to be a headquarters for what God wanted to do through the nation of Israel as a blessing to Abraham, to the world. Israel is the only People, the Jewish people are the only people who, that received their national purpose before their uh, territorial existence. Um, but they go together. There are three elements, the chosen people, chosen times, chosen place. It is the way God governs his world. Um, and for that, we need, we need the land of Israel. The land of Israel has always been critical in God's plan of redemption for humankind. Here. His chosen people would live, write the Bible, and exemplify for the world how to worship the one true God. God promised that through Abraham's descendants, the children of Israel, that the entire world would be blessed. And God proved his faithfulness to Israel by providing divine assistance, sometimes even miraculous victories, as they boldly and courageously took the land he promised them. There is so much we can learn by studying Israel's conquest of Canaan. First, we can see just how important this land is to God and to Israel. It is such a critical part of God's covenant with Israel and his plan to bless and save the world through them, a plan which we will explore deeper in future episodes. Second, as Christians, it's comforting to know that the God of Israel, the very God that we trust, is a faithful God. God certainly proved faithful to his promises by supernaturally ensuring Israel's victorious conquest of the land he swore to their forefathers. And if he is faithful to Israel, then we can be confident that he will also be faithful to us. And there are even more timeless truths to be drawn from these ancient stories of victorious conquest. Joshua had big shoes to fill, taking over for Moses as the leader of Israel. And on top of that, he had an enormous task ahead of him to lead Israel at long last to conquer the promised land. There is no doubt in my mind that Joshua struggled to remain confident and full of faith. There's a reason why God needed to repeatedly encourage him. You know, perhaps you are facing a difficult task or crisis. Maybe you're breaking new ground or about to enter a new chapter in life full of unknowns. Listen to God's comforting and timeless truths for you today. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go.